All right, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Austin Smiley back with another episode of Beyond the Well. Had a little stir up last week, and I think you and I, our guest today is one of my former uh, professors, somebody I admire greatly and actually trained under for jujitsu and stuff. Um, we're <laughs> we're part, con- yes. exactly. I think we're convinced that up until this point, this uh, appearance has been cursed. It's been like a year in the making. There's been like seven or eight cancellations for various reasons, but I'm very glad to have you here. Very glad to speak to you again. Great to be here, Austin. Yeah, I, I, we were joking about it last time. I think we've each canceled a couple, had technical issues. Yeah, last week I was uh, traveling and couldn't get my um, my hotspot to to get enough bandwidth to run Zoom, or at least it was really really glitchy. So yeah, today I'm here. Glad to be here. Look forward to it. Get been looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, really. Get this. I woke up this morning and I was uh, working on some some homework stuff. And my dad got home from from work like a couple hours ago. He came in and knocked on my door. He's like, "Hey, are you going to work today?" I was like, "No." <laughs> and I was like, "Why?" He's like, "Oh, you have a flat tire." Like, are you really <laughs> of all days? <laughs> of all days, right now, I've had I've you know I've been driving for a while. I've only had two. So this is the second one and it happened on today of all days. And I, I found out about it at like two 30. I'm like, I don't care. I'm just going to leave it alone and I'll deal with it tomorrow. Uh, oh, yeah. That, that yeah. I kept fearing that today as well. Something's going to come up. Yeah. There's going to be some, some glitch, but cool. We're, we're already in a pandemic. I don't know what else can get, uh, what, what else can yeah, happen. Don't, don't tempt fate at this point. Right. Yeah, There's exactly. all those memes about that. Right. Don't, <sighs> don't question 2021. Don't yeah, look in that <laughs> random hole in your backyard. Just don't. There's always that one of my favorite ones is the uh, people are sitting around at each other are like on New Year's and looking at 1159 waiting it to happen and then it turns to 1160. <laughs> it's just never, it's, it's never going to end. It's just never going to end. But I think that's a great place to start. I mean, you are a college professor, obviously. I trained on you for uh, jujitsu for a little while there. I was really enjoying that. Very, very bummed that I mean, that's what well, I'm feeling too. the most. Yeah, I, I imagine yeah. you are. I mean, the gyms were open for what, like a month and a half and then they closed again? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually never returned to jujitsu. Um, I've, um, I mean, I'm still training on my own a bit and uh, training my son in the garage, but I'm, yeah, a little bit, a little bit phobic. I'm not, not returning the mats. Um, a lot of gyms have kind of off the, off the books training going on. And I know I could mm-hmm. train, but I, yeah, I, some combination of guilt and shame and phobias have kept me away, but yeah, I was training, um, yeah, five or six days a week for most of the last 10 years and then started that program at Chafee where you trained and uh, that's just been such a blast, man. Such a good break from philosophy and, and still combining, I don't know, uh, interests of mine in a way that, that was fun and, and they kind of cross-pollinate them I and I, we'll talk about that at some point, but I think, yeah, philosophy and, and, uh, and martial arts actually can go together and maybe should go together. Maybe it's more normative. <laughs> But that, that part of my life, um, yeah, unfortunately, is on, on hold right now. So, Yeah, I was just about to, just about to say that. I was like, they, they really aren't separate. I mean, philosophies. I, I think we actually talked about that briefly one time. We were talking about uh, John Danaher. I had been yep. listening to some of his interviews and stuff, and that guy's got a PhD in philosophy. And he, you talk to him, the whispering lizard, as I've heard some people yep. refer to him as. And yep. he, he says, yeah, he sounds the same way, and he's discussing yeah. all these different things. I was like you can see the way a philosophical like philosophical mind can look at the some like the sport of jiu-jitsu or really martial arts as a whole and find all these similarities and uh, like life lessons that you can pull from them as far as like jiu-jitsu goes how long i don't think i've ever asked you how long have you actually been training yeah so uh, that's a, a bit of a i don't know of a discussion but <laughs> i uh, had always wanted to do martial arts wanted to to do martial arts uh growing up and wasn't really allowed to uh, interestingly enough, for, for fairly religious reasons. So I think like you, I grew up in a fairly conservative religious home and there was something at that point in the 80s and 90s suspect about martial arts, right? That they were part of the occult oh, or this, this kind of nefarious Eastern philosophy. I don't even know, but I remember that got, the, the, my parents put the kibosh on that a couple of times, uh, but then uh, basically right when I turned 18, I mean, I feel like I could tell the story in a more entertaining way but but I, I think right when I turned 18 like within a few weeks there I joined an MMA gym so this is in the 90s um, and started uh, training and jujitsu was kind of just a small part of it at that point this is right in the middle of the first UFCs I mean I don't even know single digits right the UFCs are just starting and um, 
And so we, there was a guy that would come in, and I think he trained with us pretty regularly, but would come in to teach uh, jujitsu. And uh, I think one day a week we did kind of straight jujitsu. The rest was kickboxing, American boxing, whatever, Muay Thai, and um, and some also, you know, whatever, karate and taekwondo. But I found that I enjoyed jujitsu and getting back to what we've just been talking about, kind of the cerebral element of it, right? That you kind of plan your attack. There's a certain chess element to it, right? There's attacks and counters and counter to counters and counter to counter to counters. And I actually, of all things, just this week, I moved a new desk into my office and I found my old journal and, uh, from, from Jiu Jitsu or from martial arts, from MMA. And it has, I guess you can't really see it, but well, here it is. Oh, wow. And I have daily entries of all these moves. Uh, most of these, yeah, from the 90s. This is the whole year of 98. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I found, found that interesting and, and did a couple years of that and then trained off and on at a few places, but pretty sporadically, um, just, you know, weeks or months at a time, and then took a hiatus for a few years. And then about 10 years ago, went back and just pretty much full time, like went back and within a month I was hooked again and, and doing the, you know, four or five, six days a week, mostly. Yeah, that's, I mean, back in the nineties, uh, you mentioned like your, your religious family, which we've talked about before too. I mean, oh, yeah. if, if you look at some, even now, like the whole Aikido thing and Taekwondo, oh, yeah. a lot of them are very culty. I mean, they all wear the same outfits. They move their hands around in very suspicious looking <laughs> ways. And yeah. he's casting spells. He might throw a kick in there to, you know, shadow it, but he, they're, they're doing magic. I mean, it, yeah, it looks like such a spectacle too. It's, it's always such a good time to watch like the Steven Seagal's of the world. He's all old and bloated now, and he just like <laughs> wrist and people do backflips and things like that. It's just yeah, I'm actually writing about that. I, I've I kind of t paused it for a bit, but up until about a month ago, one of my COVID projects was writing about kind of fake martial arts. Um, and there's a couple websites and even a podcast uh, that titled Bullshito instead of Bushido, right? This sort of Japanese samurai code or whatever. It's Bullshito and um, yeah, a couple, couple of blogs about it, a podcast, uh, a bunch of articles, but nothing really that academic, at least that I could find. There's uh, one book on martial arts and philosophy, and it gets into some of that. But what you were just talking about interested me the most, right? The part of martial arts that engages in superstition and some of the ritual uh, stuff that might border on cult behavior. <laughs> and especially, I mean, you know, your viewers can Google and watch any number of videos of the, you know, these these masters of whatever energy fields and then they move their hand a certain way and just dozens of their acolytes go flying over and football on their back writhing in pain and it's such a theatrical performance but but it reminded me of some of the kind of charismatic stuff I experienced growing up right I mean exorcisms and you know the word of faith movement stuff and you know Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and some of these um, these charismatic figures who who do some of this stuff, right? You get a following, they sort of learn these behaviors and learn the scripts as it were. And, and yeah, the way in which it is experienced as real by the practitioners, but from the outside uh, and from a social psychologist perspective, it's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> it says a lot about the human condition, not a lot about actual magic or superstition. Um, but yeah, so, so I was writing about that first, just kind of comparing the two kind of faith healing and, some of that stuff with uh, some of the more fringe martial arts. And then it kind of got into what you were just saying, more just how um, there's just a lot of parallels <laughs> even outside of that the superstitious stuff. But anyway, so I, I do, I have seen that in my own experience, people that get into it for those reasons and find, um, you know, maybe they're let down a bit when it doesn't deliver on the magic or the ability to destroy 10 opponents with a wave of the hand. So. Yeah, it's it's the, the whole psychogenic illness thing, a mass psychogenic illness. Like you see it in, yeah, I, I didn't really quite draw those same parallels, but I mean, you take a step back, you use the word acolytes to describe these uh, young kids yeah. doing front flips around their master. That's exactly yeah. what it is. I mean, I'm reminded, like, I think the first video I ever saw of that was uh, some master of some bullshito yeah. came into a dominant cruises gym like 10 oh, or 15 geez. years ago like a long just time ago got destroyed probably <laughs> he he threw a, yeah. i think he threw like a kick and got taken down immediately and then basically <sighs> got yeah you, you yeah. know the story I there's a few it, of those challenge videos um and there's there that are pretty brutal right where and, and the, the the moment that i want to pause uh just for like discussion on those videos is 
where the right the fiction meets reality and and oh not even in the in the practitioner but their their acolytes and so one of them um i guess i should have looked this up beforehand but it's um yeah some master of energy fields uh and some kind of average uh to to according to his own description right mma guy challenges him there was like a i think the 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 energy field guy had a five thousand dollar challenge whatever it is you might have seen this video it's yeah. it made the rounds and yeah, he has all of his people there and, you know, and the guy just, the other guy walks up, knocks him, knocks him down, bloodies his nose, he gets up, hits him again, they call it. But to see the disillusion, what I want to pause is at that moment right there, right, where these people have put their faith in this leader, their fearless leader, right, they're, maybe they're a cult leader, if we're using that metaphor, they're Jim Jones. <laughs> um, and, and they just can't believe it. I mean, they thought this guy, they believed until that moment that this guy was going to channel these energy fields and do just what he's done to them a hundred times to this poor unsuspecting MMA guy. And, and of course, you know, the actual skills of the mixed martial artists just destroy this guy. And it's sad. I mean, it's, it's, in fact, it's really painful to watch. Like, it reminds me of the disillusionment that some experience with that type of religious stuff. Uh, but, the, but the consequences are immediate. I mean, it's just, yeah, this guy has a bloody nose and he's doubled over on the floor in a matter of seconds, you know, and it's, it's brutal. Yeah, shin to the face is a much yeah. bigger wake up call than like, <laughs> oh, this was my upbringing and 10 to 15 years later, I'm kind of putting it together that this probably wasn't true. I think in that circumstance, I think we've all experienced some kind of indoctrination of some kind. I know as a younger guy now and like building up my own life and really starting to open up and see you know, the world in different perspectives, that's uh, that indoctrination starts to, to eat at you a little bit and you start becoming more and more aware of it the more life that you start living things are this way and that's that's kind of what like i brought up the uh, traveling that i was lucky enough to do uh recently yeah. and i was able to get out and actually see the world and of course in ireland we weren't in northern ireland thankfully the ira was <laughs> nowhere to be found but um yeah that, that kind of indoctrination is just so fascinating and then you see people in the crowds like this master gets his yeah. gets his world turned upside down yeah. literally and yep. Yep. so to his audience and they, they're, they're met with reality for the first time. And it, it is kind of sad, but there's a part of me that just is it's all wicked. And I really enjoy that. <laughs> but I, I, it's just, it's the spectacle of the whole event. And um, I, I think it's a very good way to put it. It's very culty, very cult like. Yeah. I, I have both the, the, I don't even know the, um, the desire to see that justice and and maybe it's delayed but, but i'm still using the term instant karma here right this expectation that's based on false beliefs and confusions about the nature of the world <laughs> um and i, I want to see that disillusionment in some ways but um but when you see often what drives people to that disillusionment right the depth of their needs i mean you don't have to get into freud too much to understand this but but uh and you might not be the best bet there but i mean you see what existential needs people have or or even the case of martial arts sometimes i mean i it's often people and i've seen this in schools i've been to right that have a fear of their own personal safety and 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 maybe we're bullied or whatever and you know and obviously good martial arts can be a good corrective to that and can help grow confidence and i think many many martial arts and many traditional ones are great for that right but <laughs> i think there's a predatory component to some of these fake martial arts where they promise that and even promise that you know, par excellence. I mean, they promised the world you're going to be able to, you know, move things with your mind. I mean, the telekinesis and all these energy fields. And, and, and so it's like the depth of their need drives that desperation and their goal ability. And so that's where it seems parasitic to me upon that goal ability and that need uh, on the part of the masters. Now, interestingly, they're often part of it too. Like, I think they, many of them could pass a lie detector test. They believe that, that what they're doing is actual. So almost the way in which this operates at the sub or unconscious level was really fascinating to me. Um, and I want it to be corrected, but, but in some cases not so brutally, or I feel a little bit badly for some of the acolytes, right? I could imagine, you know, a few of them, you know, just being hurting individuals who needed to believe in something and to have it shattered this way can be brutal. Um, but I've seen some with faith healing, you know, Peter Popoff, right? I think he actually lives pretty locally, but he was exposed by Amazing Randy, right? On the Tonight Show for fake, word of faith stuff where his wife was reading the comment cards or the prayer cards at, at one of these big healing services and uh, you know, was exposed. He's back now, by the way, oh, uh, no. he's on TV regularly and his website uh, is very active and all, you know, new stories and new healing crusades. But the point is, 
and when that happened, uh, and I was a kid when that happened, but I remember when I first saw it, um, uh, as an adult anyway, I was like, this is just, you know, amazing that this happened in the most devastating way possible, very public. Uh, it really ruined his career for a bit. And that, that kind of karma, I think, is well-deserved. Um, the people that were duped by him, um, both financially and in terms of their faith and their hope for healing, who traveled the world to right, get healed by him or have their child get healed by him like that that's very tragic to me and is the toxic side of, of that type of faith. Um, so yeah, even in that, right, I'm watching this, I'm like, oh, this is great. You know, he's getting taken down uh, by reality and by, um, yeah, Amazing Randy was great, right? Mm -hmm. Randy, uh, in that regard, but then, you know, so many people were taken in by him and, and to the tune of their entire life savings. I mean, he had a particular algorithm for extracting the most amount of money out of the people who would write in. Um, um, yeah, I know a bit about that, but I won't get into that here. But, oh, uh, but yeah, he, he had an entire algorithm for that, and people were put into categories to get you know, the most money out of out of the you know the believers. So anyway, Scientology yeah, turned that into an art. I mean, <laughs> they have like twelve <laughs> members in the world, and they have billions and billions of dollars. I mean, that kind of it's the primary, like the main point there is it's the same snake oil. That's being sold in different ways by different people. James Randi's one of the best. I love watching like some of his older like uh, oh, tapes, yeah. and you got the guys sitting there with their fingers on their temples, like, oh, like the really yeah, really intently. The, the the spoon bender guy, you know, <laughs> exactly the spoon. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah, and then it's so good. One of my favorite examples of that. I was actually just <laughs> listening to some old uh, talkback interviews that uh, yeah. Bob Larson did in the eighties and nineties. Those are just I love listening to those. Oh, He's doing exorcisms over Skype these days. Oh wow! I, I have oh wow! I, I only know of his radio days. I had a, a colleague in grad school who was trying to convince me of the power of the supernatural, and he played one of those, uh, you know, on radio exorcisms, and I, I was trying not oh, to laugh. Uh, but but even there, that you know, this this, this guy in a graduate program in philosophy, like he was in some ways, you know, uh, tethering his belief in the supernatural to these types of things, and it it rang so hollow when you hear it, right? The theatrics of it and whatever, and I'm like, this this is a a graduate philosophy educated, uh, that sounded uneducated, <laughs> college educated graduate hey. student philosophy, who's, uh, who's, you know, kind of worldview hinges upon the possibility and reality of Bob Larson's exorcisms, right? And yeah, man, I got you. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, there was a, uh, yeah, a specific portion of one that I listened to last night where he was playing back an old recording of uh, like the guitar player, the lead guitar player, I don't remember his name from uh, Morbid Angel back in like, okay, yeah. was, like 93. And it was yep. one of those like live exorcisms and you can just listen like Morbid Angel is, they're, they're a metal band. I yeah. know, I can hear in this man's voice that he's just clowning him so hard. <laughs> And Bob is, oh, is he just there. playing along like he's getting exercised. Or yeah, whatever? he was he was sitting there saying like the demons won't come out of me. The only person who can exercise them is Glenn Benton from Deicide, who is another like <laughs> famous Satanist from those days. And I was like, what? Oh, and, and these people, I think Bob Larson, I don't I feel like I, I saw somewhere. I don't know. I like, don't quote me on this for now, yeah. but um, he has some sort of educational background. So it's it's not like he's just, you know, some some ninny like showing yeah, up at a circus, like trying to move things with his mind. Like, no, this, yeah. this man is really, really, I flip flop for a while with him. I was curious. Is it with charlatan or is he actually drinking his own Kool-Aid? I think to this point, this man is in his late seventies and he's doing exorcisms over Skype. I see the conviction in him. I really want to believe he believes it. You know, at yeah. least there's some sort of, you know, pseudo honesty behind what he's doing. Cause at least he believes the sham, but I, I just don't think so. I mean, like you, yeah. this this student you were talking about, the one who was basically yeah. hinging a lot of his uh, his belief on Bob Larson's, he he really believed this is what you're saying. Oh yeah, like he really. Oh yeah, no, and he thought it was persuasive. So it came up in a in a course. So we haven't talked about um, how I came into the philosophy of religion, which might I was just be about fine. to ask that. Yeah, <laughs> little segue. Let's talk about it. Yeah, brief, <laughs> yeah, back it up a minute. But no, I ended up at a school of theology after undergrad. I was at. Uh, Talbot School of Theology, which is Biola's graduate school of theology, right? People go to become uh, pastors or just get training or whatever. And 
So I was, in, I was doing an MA program in philosophy, religion, and ethics, but you had a couple years, like a three-year degree, two years of which was the basic kind of seminary type requirements, the school theology requirements. So, you know, systematic theology, one through four, your, your you know, historical theology courses, Old Testament, New Testament, all this stuff. So I'm in the class on, um, it must have been on like, you know, the one that had Satanology, Demonology, uh, Angelology, the like Theology 4 or whatever. Yeah. And it's being taught as if this is just matter of fact, right? Like the, the taxonomy of angels and demons and what their powers are. And like, this is awesome. And I was, you know, I was there for different reasons. Um, you know, some, some personal related to my sorting out my own religiosity, uh, some academic. Um, but I, I didn't really believe in that. And so I made some comment about, you know, demon, like, you know, about the power of demons and they, do they really have causal powers of the world. And this, this friend of mine in the program said, oh yeah, like, demons have been proven and this and that and I remember just being like like what because I grew up with some of that I've been to many um, services where they were mass exorcisms and I, oh. I sort of unwittingly participated in some of them <laughs> as a child um, and even some later on but the point being yeah so the, this guy says well no this is it and and he I go over to his house I, I don't remember all the details but I remember on the way just thinking like, what is he going to show me because he kept saying he had proof and whatever and like and he's a you know graduate student in philosophy I'm like this is going to be epic and I was thinking kind of ghost hunters or paranormal but for real or whatever I guess it was before those things but that kind of thing right he's gonna have yeah, you're some, old let's not forget that yeah man I, and this is this is the 90s as well right I was in seminary yeah for school theology from 90 uh beginning of 98 to the end of 2000. So it was well, one of those years, I don't know. And yeah, he played, uh, he had, you know, tapes that he had recorded, I guess, from radio uh, and had them like, you know, whatever, categorized or, or in some, some um, whatever, like uh, Rolodex type thing where it was like, here's what they are. And this is one on these demons. And so he, we played a couple and yeah, I was convinced uh, that this, this was both actual and, and concrete proof of not just the supernatural, but of, concrete claims in Christian theology, like about demons and all this stuff. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I felt badly for him that he found those convincing. Um, I remember telling him, I didn't think I, I appreciated it, but I didn't, I didn't think that that was that convincing. And he couldn't believe that I didn't find it convincing. I said, it's entertaining and it, the theatrics are fascinating. And, you know, I, but anyway, I just, yeah. I've recently had debates and not to square too far off because I do definitely want to get behind your background, but there, I recently had a conversation with someone who was trying to convince me of the, like, basically they're trying to prove to me that aliens helped the ancient Egyptians build the pyramids. And he's like, I have proof. I have this Ashton Bronson on ancient aliens. What are you? <laughs> he was in the video. It was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, so see, see, here's the thing. And this guy, he's a really nice guy. He's really entertaining. He's fun to hang out with. But and this is sort of reminds me of uh, this, this friend of yours that was trying to yeah. convince you of this. It's like you're show. I'm sitting here. You said you have proof of aliens built, like helping build these things, and I'm sitting here watching an ancient alien special, yeah. and the proof that you're showing me is some guy from russia who has a degree from a college that i don't know exists or not like it's just a video it's just some guy like this isn't what is your standard of evidence do you have a standard that you're applying this to or is this just this convinces me on an emotional level i can understand it to the extent that i can understand it therefore it's true it's not very verified it's just a matter of this is convincing to me yeah and it's funny i'm like i mean you know a little bit about my work in philosophy religion and I'm, i'm pretty sympathetic to uh, different types of evidence in religion. Obviously, I don't think empirical evidence for a lot of religious claims make much, makes much sense. Um, this is kind of where I part ways with some of the new atheists. Um, my dissertation was on them. I was kind of writing on comparing Hitchens and Harris and Dawkins and Dennett and that mm-hmm. gang with, um, with kind of mainstream figures in contemporary philosophy religion. And I was trying to show how they're kind of unlikely bedfellows, right? That you have philosophers who are playing this sort of apologetics game or you know, science and religion game that the, the new atheists are playing. And I, I think that whole game is sort of confused, right? That it try to prove God through, I don't know, some science experiment or something. Or yeah. I think that that's fundamentally wrongheaded. Uh, but then I don't think it makes sense to say that no proof or evidence should matter. I think there are types of proof and evidence and some of those are more personal, right? So I don't know that it would, would prove that God exists or something, but, but maybe like William James, 
sort of says, right, that there can be a power that these experiences have for you. It's not really transferable, right? I may have an experience that I take to be religious and make sense of my life. That, that it's not authoritative for you. And mm -hmm. there's no reason why you should or would be convinced by that. Um, and, and I think that that can be, you know, within the realm of human experience, a, 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 a thing that happens that I'm, I don't think, I don't pathologize it, right? Uh, but I think people go beyond there and do take those experiences or, or play that game of evidence with many religious claims uh, and, and they, they sort of trespass, right? That they, they go into the realm of thinking this is proof or evidence of a more, uh, you know, third party accessible sort or of a concrete sort or scientific sort. Uh, and that's, that's where I sort of draw the line. So getting back to your thing about angels and demons or, or people who had these experiences, I, I doubt, I, I don't doubt that <laughs> they count these things as evidence. Um, I don't know that that's the kind of evidence that I think uh, should warrant that belief. Like I think for me that those are superstitious or confused uh, oftentimes. Uh, now, if, he, if my friend just said, hey, you know, I, I, I see my life in this way in relationship to, this, you know, to God or whatever, and, and I've had experiences that make sense of that for me, I, I you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't entirely get it, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I think that that's kind of the realm, that's sort of the loop, right? That you close the loop or close the circuit, that there's sort of uh, powerful forms of experience that one takes as evidentiary in a certain way. I don't know that those ever could meet the standard of objective evidence or scientific evidence. And so I actually think it's sort of a fool's errand for religious apologists to try to do that, right? So whether it's my friend with these tapes, or the William Lane Craig's of this world, or others that I'm sure you know. Oh. William Lane Craig, just just point of, uh, of historical fact, he was my first um, philosophy, graduate professor in philosophy. So oh my God! In the winter term of '98, oh. when I started, uh, he does was he's a research professor at Biola at Talbot, uh, and he had his he interview with with Hitchens there. Yeah, so, so I was, I was yeah. just thinking about that too. I was like, wait, Biola, oh, William Lane yeah. Craig, yeah, his like sonnet yeah, so, stuff went there. Uh, yeah, so I didn't take it uh, for credit. I sat in on it or audited or whatever, but I had a friend who was in the class, so I just went out with him. Uh, it was several hours a day for however long it was. I don't know, a couple weeks, I guess. Um, maybe just a week. It seemed like forever. I think it was two weeks. Uh, and kind of got that baptism by fire <laughs> into, uh, into the world of Christian apologetics, which I knew not much about. Uh, and But that, that type of apologetics or um, attempt to you know, to provide rational proof or evidence or and or empirical proof or evidence for religious claims, uh, I think is just wrong headed. It leads to a lot of a lot of bad philosophy and often a lot of bad science. You know, we have these projects like the, you know, um, the Benson prayer study a few years ago yeah. right? uh, or these these studies that attempt to prove these supernatural things. I think those are often based on deep confusions about the nature of religious language. Um, that I see really at the core of so much contemporary philosophy religion, at least Anglo-American philosophy religion. I think, you know, um, other places in the world do some pretty good stuff, but uh, I think we, we have a unique problem here of <laughs> kind of this hyper-scientized uh, approach to philosophy religion. Uh, not all, but, but, you know, I experienced that firsthand, so. Well, of course, to get back to your uh, Biola days, I know you mentioned yeah. that when you started out at, uh, like, university and things like that, you had your own religious experience that you were trying to figure out your own religious viewpoint oh yeah how did that philosophy religious study for one biola it's a religious university how, how did that all come together do you ended up like starting there <laughs> oh man uh i don't <laughs> i think i'm gonna understand what you're saying more than you think i will so. okay no I, I think you probably will i just don't know that your listeners will find my particular journey that interesting <laughs> well hey uh, this, is, this is this is this is my thing Cool. Okay. Then, then for you, I'll indulge. Um, like I said, I, I'm self-conscious of it as well as um, I don't know that that much can be learned from it, but, but it is kind of a good case study, I guess, in, in kind of 1990s evangelical Christianity. Um, so yeah, my own background, my dad was, uh, you know, Italian, Roman Catholic, um, moved here from Philadelphia towards the end of high school, met my mother. Uh, they got married young. I mean, they were 19 and 20. Uh, and my mom, um, Although it was raised German Lutheran, uh, she, I, I don't even know, honestly, the years, but at some point, I guess, had to be before I was born, because I grew <laughs> but had gotten into the stuff that we just had mentioned, uh, word of faith movement, um, you know, sort of, I guess, third wave, charismatic Christianity, right? So a lot of this 
a little bit of health and wealth gospel, but a lot of the, the you know, charismatic um, stuff with spiritual gifting. And this is where I, you know, was a, a some sort of participant in these exorcisms and, and, you know, group sessions of speaking in tongues and a lot of this sort of stuff. So my upbringing, even though there's some cultural, you know, Catholic stuff with my dad, and he went along with my mother's sort of newfound religiosity, but, but I think, um, yeah, I don't think his heart was in it ever. <laughs> I think he sort of just, you know, granted her that, that role of the sort of matriarch in terms of religiously. So I grew up with that stuff um, and um, pushed back against it like many do in my teenage years and at some point stopped going to church. Um, but, you know, we were once, twice, three times a week church folk. Um, and early on was very charismatic, very not denominationally Pentecostal, right? But, but charismatic. So speaking in tongues and a lot of dancing and, you know, oh. but, yeah, I, I remember those years. <laughs> a certain fondness in a really funny way, though, of, of, you know, the, at least I'd almost cultivate, right? My friends and family friends, and it was really intense and whatever, but, but very scary. And there's a lot of stuff that I think was really traumatic, um, you know, in, in that of literally fearing Satan and, you know, believing his minions, you know, all these demons are out to get us. And, and a lot of that stuff seemed really, of course, I had no other referent, right? That seemed very real. And so I, I grew up with a very supernatural view of things. Well, anyway, long story short, I'll cut to the, the more academic piece. So I finished at UC Riverside uh, in an applied social science degree. So anthropology, psychology, and sociology and was applying to graduate programs uh, in anthropology. I think a couple in sociology, but I you know, just started getting information from uh, the UCs and other schools, and there was sort of like a spiritual intervention <laughs> where um, I don't know how to tell the story if it's, if it's as crazy as I remembered or not. But, uh, but yeah, I remember my mother sitting me down and saying, you know, you should look into um, doing a degree at a religious school, and that none of the schools I was applying to were religious. Uh, and she had some contacts at Biola and knew some of these, these faculty. And I remember, I don't want to say I was entirely guilted into it, but, but there was sort of a, yeah, like I owe it to my family or owe it to my tradition, even though at that point I wasn't going to church or, or terribly involved. Um, and so I did, I met with some of the faculty there um, and yeah, heard about William Lane Craig and some of these Christian apologists, and at least in that game or in that world, they were kind of the big figures. And I did feel a sense of duty to do it. I pushed back against it. But anyway, bottom line, I got accepted there and started that program. Uh, and then about halfway through, um, I think I was fairly disillusioned with it um, and didn't see it delivering on what it had promised, right? That, that the intellectual foundations of a Christian worldview could be settled and and well established and that these arguments for God's existence and things that, you know, the program promised to uh, both teach us and convince us of, I just, yeah, they, again, they, they rang really hollow academically and even personally, it didn't really you know, make a lot of sense. Um, and then I just was at this point where it's a three-year program and I was debating whether to, you know, <laughs> complete it or not, but it was sort of like redeeming equity, right? I'm far enough along, I'll finish the program. So I finished uh, and then the next year started uh, my PhD program at Claremont uh, in philosophy, religion, and theology. Um, and I feel like there was able to get, you know, uh, into writing and researching stuff that made more sense and found ways of understanding religion that I don't think harbored as many confusions and stuff that, that uh, as the stuff that I ran into both personally growing up and, uh, you know, at Biola. So I'm skipping tons of details and I, stories that, things that happened there that, <laughs> blew my mind, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, part of my history, and, and I think it still helps me relate to a lot of, you know, fundamentalist students, uh, evangelical, so that they're sort of traditional fundamentalists, so one thing interesting about Biola is at the time, they sort of pushed back against some of the evangel, or the charismatic stuff, right, mm -hmm. um, they're dispensationalists uh, as a school, and I'm not all the faculty believe that, but this idea that maybe spiritual gifts aren't for today and stuff, and I, I kind of like that at the time of just having that part to push back on, you know, that, hey, this is another type of evangelicalism that thinks the type I was raised with is kind of crazy, you know, like, that's kind of cool, <laughs> um, and then had a stint going to an Eastern Orthodox church uh, during that time period, and then worked with a, a church startup for a while, um, uh, but by the time I was done with seminary, I was 
yeah, out of the realm of, of you know, uh, Christian theology and more in, in philosophy, religion, academically and, and personally. I mean, it, it's a messy, messy game. I mean, that's, that's kind of, I refer to it again, like just as myself, I'm about the same age as you were when you were going through a lot of this stuff oh, yeah. and figuring it all out. And yeah. there's a, a part of me that definitely wants to, and you mentioned how this is like, this is very personal and these experiences yeah. are very meaningful. They absolutely are. And I'm starting to see like a lot of these things that I thought I was past, like just over the past couple of years, I've been grappling with my own like uh, spirituality and worldview and trying to kind of figure it out. Yeah. And I found myself caught up again, and like really going back and researching the things that I was raised in and trying to take it like a, a different perspective on it. And the more, and I, I want to know if you've sort of felt the same way, because I've, mm -hmm. I always go back and listen to debates and things like that. And, uh, Oh yeah. Go back and I read things like I have a uh, Hitchens book uh, just right there. Um, which wait, I forgot. Yeah, God, God, is, God is not great. That one. Yep. Um, and I actually want to read his autobiography his stuff too, like Hitch 22. But yep. um, I, I go back and I read these things and I have a big old study Bible here that was gifted to me by a family member, which I'm sure you had too. And I've read through most of that. And I, I just, I try and keep as much of an open mind as possible, but the more I really get into it, the more disillusioned I become with it, the more I hear these arguments that these people sound so convinced of. And I'm like, I just, nah, I'm just not seeing it like that. I'm just not yeah. picking up on it. Th this disillusionment is, is kind of painful, especially if you've grown up in it and you can use it as a way to connect with family members or to connect with a community of people, which I also tried to do. And ultimately you kind of, you're left sitting there as being the guy in the room who just feels like, yeah, I don't have anything in common with any of you. I'm not yeah. seeing this. Oh yeah, I definitely, I mean, I, yeah, I share a lot of those experiences <laughs> and even now, right? I still many uh, parts of my family, uh, most extended family now, I think are still very much in, in that world or those worlds of very conservative Christianity and have, you know, this Christian worldview that becomes the lens through which they view all things. Uh, and most poignantly now, things like politics and, and COVID, right? That that's still religified in a way that seems unfathomable to me now and, and very catastrophic in many ways uh, if you care about humanity. <laughs> but, um, but I know what that's like, and maybe that's the part where you're kind of saying too, like having lived that and knowing what that feels like to believe in that genuinely, um, you know, without malice, I don't think that I was judging people in the way that, you know, conservative Christians are seem to be judging or, or being anti-science and they're like, you don't view it that way. Those are the criticisms of, of, of your views and maybe the consequences of your views. And so I feel like I'm sympathetic. And even now I have a few students, even during this COVID period that I'm um, Zooming with pretty regularly that are kind of in that same, they remind me of me at 19 or 20. And it's, it's kind of cool to be able to, like I can empathize with that, with those struggles uh, and not villainize them or, you know, try to pop their bubble or something, right? Like as if they're, they're they're blameworthy for for some of these views uh, but that said yeah so so after my own sort of leaving some of that um yeah i feel like i'm not i'm <laughs> i think there was a period where i was angry or or would fall into that more that category really rejecting religion or whatever uh I, i'm not that way now i mean i think there can be much good in it i I don't think that some of the things we're talking about here, um, you know, with its con with religiosity's connection to certain superstitious views or to politics, like I'm still very critical of that. But I, I think what I've been able to do is carve out a space for the possibility of of having you know reasonable, non irrational anyway uh, types of religiosity. Right. I have too many friends and colleagues that you know are that live these lives, and so I feel like. I know this is kind of rambling, but <laughs> but I'm coming back to, to the possibility of yeah having like sensible religious practices that aren't conceptually confused, that aren't superstitious, that aren't anti-science, um, you know. And I think for Hitchens and Harris and those people, they want to say, well, then they're less religious, right? Because the definition of religion is superstitious mm -hmm. nonsense. And I want to say, no, I don't accept. Don't let the fundamentalists define what true religiosity is. And I feel like that's what some of the new atheists and kind of more radical atheist types have done is they let religion be defined by you know, the, the most, I don't know, fundamentalist or conservative voices, and then kind of show the nonsense of the superstition. And I always wanted to say them. In fact, I did talk to Sam Harris uh, once for a little while. Um, the others I 
haven't, I didn't have a chance to, I did go to some events where Hitchens was there, um, but I wanted to say the same thing to them, right? Like, like that's too easy of a job <laughs> uh, to, to, to be satisfied with. Like, so, so fine, show how fundamentalism or spiritualism is flawed or, or you know, superstitious, that's fine. Now that we've cleared the brush, now let's talk about, you know, the possibilities of sense and meaning for religion and look at that and maybe still be critical, that's fine. Uh, but don't take the sort of straw man <laughs> um, from the fundamentalist as the authentic thing or the most authentic or accept their standard of religiosity as the real standard. So the most religious person that both fundamentalists and the new atheists would agree is the most religious person is the fundamentalist, literalist, everything in the Bible, you know, God says it, I believe it, that settles it, bumper sticker Christian. And I'm saying, don't, why let them carry the day and, and be the ones defining and framing this debate. And so I think they're kind of unlikely bedfellows, both this kind of intellectual atheism uh, and fundamentalists, you know, believers and, and philosophers. And so that's why whenever I've had students ask me that eventually, right, I tell them, I'll, tell, I'll talk to them about my religious beliefs after class. I'm like, oh, so are you like an atheist or something? I'm like, well, I reject the, that whole discussion, right? So an atheist, is only a thing, a theism is a thing, as if there's this sort of some set of beliefs that should be debated rationally or scientifically. And I think that's just an unhelpful way of looking at religion or understanding what religion is. I think we have a duty as philosophers, as social scientists, as people interested in the human condition to actually dig deeper and look at the possibilities of meaning and sense uh, for religion. And, and, and one of the varieties, this is really William Jamesian again, right? Which is funny, I, I actually, James isn't, I appreciate James, but he's not one of my main philosophers, but it's like I come back to some of his points, right, in the variety of religious experience, that religion amounts to different things for different people, and there can be types of it that, you know, you connect with in some ways, other types that make no sense, or what Max Weber, right, the German sociologist, said he, he said he was always religiously unmusical, yeah. right? he said I could see, I like that's a good term, right, you can see the way that religion is done in all these ways, and maybe envious of some, and maybe bad music, right? It wants nothing to do with that. But the idea is that it's a way of being orientation to the world and to matters of morality and ultimate things that make sense for some people sometimes, can be catastrophic and devastating and horrible for some people at some times. Uh, and so these kind of universal or categorical statements about truth or falsity of theism or this or that God, like I just think what an unhelpful way to address a very complicated, you know, macro, social, psychological, anthropological phenomenon, right, then to reduce it all down to God, yay or nay. It's like, I just don't, I don't, and that's so much of the contemporary debate, at least, at least in the Anglo-American tradition. You know, you go to Scandinavia and other places where some of my colleagues have done some really good work, and you realize the debates there about religion and secularity are just very different debates. They're not interested in the God question or, you know, mm -hmm. science and religion or Adam and Eve versus, you know, versus um, human evolution. Those are just not interesting questions. And I, I think for good reason. So I think the status of contemporary philosophy of religion, at least in the Anglo-American tradition, is severely hamstrung by those problematic assumptions and inheritances of this sort of rationalism, empiricism, debate over the nature of religious truth claims or, or, or whatever. So I know I've said a lot, but getting back to what you were saying, I do find it valuable to, you know, revisit parts of my own, uh, you know, religious heritage, um, you know, but again, through a new, new lens and, and the idea of looking at it to figure out whether it's all true or false or whatever, that just, you know, doesn't work that way. I don't think it should. And the fact that I bought into it at some point uh, in doing it that way, right? Propositional or factual or evidential or scientific approaches to those questions, I, I think is unfortunate. Um, and leads to a lot of confusion personally and existentially for a lot of believers or, or non, um, even that term believers, right? We even do it like doctrinally, do you believe or not? And I think that doesn't tell me much about a person, right? Um, whether they believe or not, it's these other things. How does that relate to their morality and their family and these, these sort of other categories that are in relationship to religious ideas and concepts and so forth. Sorry, that was long. Oh, <laughs> I so soapbox it there. Sorry. We we both do that. We both like to I know. About it, but it's I'm all, this now. I mean I was I, I was reminded I did like the kind of point that you were making and how uh like the the four horsemen of yeah. uh, the new atheism thing. They did kind of them as well as the uh, the other side of the debate, at least the, the debate oh, yeah. that we have here 
they do have a way of cheapening the human experience and boiling it all down to it is or it isn't. It's yeah. true or it's not. You're, you're talking about a, a, like sense data that we all live with and different sensations and thoughts and emotions and the, these very complex systems that can't be boiled down in such a simple way, especially just you know with the tools that we have, we lack the capacity to do that. As far as like what you were what you were saying sort of reminded me of a bit of a, a universalist philosophy in that a lot of these spiritual truths that we see in like the Abrahamic religions, a lot of the pagan religions too. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Sam Harris wrote that wrote a book about objective morality and he kind of pulled some yep. of the same um, yeah. conclusions to it. But I had recently was listening to an interview with uh, Nicholas Schreck um, mm -hmm. a few days ago and he said something along the lines of, in every like all these different religious and spiritual systems, they all have their own truths, like unique to them. Mm -hmm. But the ones that actually matter and are actually quoted the most are found everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. things like treat people in a in, in a good way. Don't don't yeah, don't be a schmuck. Don't, treat, be a yeah, schmuck. don't murder exactly. each other. <laughs> golden rule. Exactly. Yeah. The golden rule. It's not Order. specific to any one uh, Middle East or Asia or yep. Scandinavia. It, it's a universal trait. And it's something that I think definitely we should take a, a better or more close look at that. Like, how are these universal experiences with religion and with spirituality affecting everybody across the globe instead of trying to conquer it the way that we do here with everything else? Yeah, yeah. They don't have to be competitors, right? Like, yeah. as if one, you know, there's always reminds of that South Park episode, right? I forget the details when they get to heaven. It's like, who's right? The Mormons. Like, the Mormons, you know? Damn and, it. <laughs> but yeah, but, but the funny thing is, you know, I think many people think of it that way. Maybe they don't think the answer is Mormonism if they're not Mormons, but they think that answer might be Christianity or Islam or even a sect of Christianity. Oh, the Catholics are right. And the, even they're just being an answer. An answer, yeah. So I agree with that. There's a, Stephen Prothero uh, has a book that I may be using. They just sent me the, his, I think it came out this year, a new version of his World Religions book, but he's at Boston uh, and he writes, he wrote a book called God is Not One. I might be blowing. I think that's what the title is. But what he gets at, which is, this is where I halfway agree with you and halfway, this might be a good point of departure uh, in our discussion, where what he tries, what he gets at in that text, and I think something that I agree with is um, that different religions are interested in different things. And there's tons of overlap. Think of the Venn diagram of religions. It's all these, you know, whatever, uh, thousands and thousands of world historic religions. And there's areas of, over, of common, commonality, right? Things about morality and golden rules, pretty common. Some kind of karmic principles, pretty common taboos against incest and murdering friendlies is his common, but, but they also disagree about how they understand, you know, what matters most in life and, and maybe even what our ultimate destiny is and whether there is an ultimate destiny, whether this life matters more than the next life or vice versa, what the path is on that alleged journey. And so, and so his point is that we should look at the diversity of traditions and not, not do, not really push for that universalist thesis so much um that that can be re, re, you know reductionistic right by saying all religions are paths to ultimate reality ultimate reality is the good place and like wait a minute the, the fact that so many define reality so differently and think of the differences between even in the judeo-christian islamic kind of family i mean the fact that judaism at least for the last couple hundred years or so is, is very humanistic it's very this worldly right there's not a lot of theology uh there's not a lot at least amongst most reform and conservative Jews, but that's the majority of, of Jews. Um, and so things that are important to Christianity or Islam, like maybe belief in God and maybe heaven or hell, um, you know, don't, don't get off the ground for many Jews. Uh, in fact, even when I've had like rabbis and stuff come to my class, I always get this sort of standoff where, where one of the Christian students says, what do you think about Jesus? And like, well, you know, you know, he's a Jew, but we don't, you know, we don't follow him. That's your thing, whatever. Like, no, no, no. But like, don't you think he's Messiah? Like, no, no, he didn't do the stuff the Bible says, like, you know, bring all Jews back and this sort of thing. And they're like, but, and then they, there's like this crisis point of like, but don't, don't you want to be saved? And they're like, no, but well, saved from what? We're Jews. Like there's no, yeah. there's no nothing. There's no original sin. You're not born in a pit needing a rope that only Jesus can provide. And so the one uh, colleague, I don't, um, oh gosh, I want to say he did it in my class. Maybe it was one that we've done some interfaith stuff, but I remember a student saying it to him. And then he said, basically this, he goes, basically Christianity solves a problem that Jews don't have. Yeah, <laughs> because, because yeah. it's great for you that you believe in sin. You got to have this this thing. You got to have a rope, and only Jesus can be rope. And God has to sacrifice Jesus to Himself to pay Himself. You know, mm -hmm. from this is sort of the cliche the, from yeah. His wrath against you, and it's this system. He's like, but that doesn't even that has no purchase in Judaism. And so that well, don't you want to know when you're going when you die? And He said the same thing. He goes, why would I care about that? There's too much going on in this world for me to worry about the afterlife. And so, 
for many Jews, the afterlife, salvation, even these, these major themes that many take to be universal and many Christian universalists or pluralists treat it that way, right? Mm -hmm. It's like all religions believe in some kind of salvation and they all have a path. And I think many Jews, many Buddhists, others would just say, no, we don't, we don't, we don't even care about those things. I don't care where I'm going when I die. Uh, in fact, to even think about that is sort of a problem, right? It's very egoistic that I would rather think about how I can make this world better uh, to engage in tikkun olam, right? To repair the world and then I'm done. And if something, you know, there's some world to come, great, but who cares? Um, and so with that said, I would think religions are very different. They share some common themes and in some areas of morality, there's a lot of overlap, but even there, I would just a temptation to generalize too much. Um, I think that difference can kind of go all the way down at times and there's no necessity there, right? It's not that the laws of morality are these sort of axioms or whatever that, that are universal. I think there's diversity there. I and mean, we do live in a world where people disagree about the most fundamental things, who you should marry, who you should kill. Um, and they say, well, we all have taboos. I remember a student, we were talking about this in class and saying, uh, I think C.S. Lewis in, um, oh, yeah. In, uh, in one of his texts, The Abolition of Man, I think, right? Has an appendix yeah. uh, that has like world, yeah, world cultures and these like mm -hmm. these values are the same. And, you know, he has like incest taboo and then lists all these cultures and codes. And I remember thinking even then, like, yeah, but some cultures believe you have a duty to marry your first cousin. And some believe you should be killed if you do so. And you could look at that and say, well, hey, we all have views about incest. You're like, yeah, but they're the opposite views. Yeah. And so the difference goes, like, there might be a gen general intuition, of course, just being human, that we should have rules and norms about family and sexuality and life and death. Uh, but the fact that answers are often the polar opposites, for me, is significant and should cause us to resist the temptation to generalize. Um, I think that, that can be a big disease that then you see play out in some of these debates, right? So, so for me, I think this is where Clifford Geertz and some of these sort of passionate particularists really appeal to me that just do justice to the diversity, you know, and resist the temptation to say more than can be said. Um, find those points of commonality when they're there, but don't force that on them. And don't say all humans really believe in karma. It's like, well, what if they don't? <laughs> all humans believe in, you know, in this incest taboo. Well, some believe the opposite. So I think you suffer the death of opposing views or what Anthony Flew said, the death uh, by a thousand qualifications, right? It's like, they're the same. Well, except for this, they're the same, except for this. Well, they're the same, except for this. And you end up, well, how are they the same if they have the opposite views and all these matters? And I think that's as much as I think pluralism and religion and universalism are noble, maybe ideas, I think they, they often suffer that death of a thousand qualifications. That what Buddhists are interested in is not the same thing as what Jews or Christians or Muslims or any of the indigenous traditions of the world are interested in necessarily. They may overlap, but they're, they may just be different. <laughs> Which two Buddhists? I mean, there, yeah, there even are, that, right? yeah, which two Buddhists, which two Christians? There are thousands of different denominations of Christianity. And, and even within Buddhism, there's like a, a number close to like 85,000 different ways to achieve nirvana, to ascend, to whatever terminology or language you want to use. There are so many different ways to get to. Oh, oh, yeah. Over 30,000 Christian, uh, a colleague of mine sent me a thing just a couple months ago that now at least some of the institutes that track religious movements are saying there's over 30,000 distinctive Christian sects, right? And so the idea that even like, there's a Christian view, I joke about in ethics class, like I say, what's the, well, the Christianity has a view. I'm like, what's the Christian view on abortion? I'm like, well, it's about 50-50, shoot. What's the Christian view of death penalty? Well, it's about 60-40, shoot. You know, like this idea that even a broad religious category somehow tells you a certain amount of sameness or a certain amount of agreement in theology or how to interpret the Bible or whatever, it's just, so yeah, that's why I'm a passionate particularist. Show me a person and I'll, we can talk about their religiosity, but even the person in the pew next to them may disagree radically about fundamental starting points as well as theology and all those things. Um, and so yeah, I, I appreciate what you said. You added that diversity even back into religious you know, categories mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah, think of the forest tradition in Thailand of you know, Buddhists who believe, monks who don't believe in living under shelter and only begging or whatever. And then you have, monks who are treated fairly well in other parts of, even in Thailand, right? Interestingly. Um, and so, so even regional types of Buddhism can be very different. Um, fair enough. Yeah, really good. Or just good. like with people. I mean, that, that's kind of the issue that you run into in the first place when you take this system and try and apply it to everyone and expect to get the same results. 
I mean, people are going to interpret it differently. Even if you take it like a literalist perspective and say this, Bob Larson, bring back to him. He was, he would, that was yes. one of his favorite things. To All do. good conversations should begin now with Bob Larson's exorcisms. <laughs> well, that was one of the things that like, one of the, the things he was real big on was, is this view philosophical? I can't do a Bob Larson impression. That's not bad. This- That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do yeah, the demon voices though <laughs> oh, man. he never did the demon but he just reacted so unenthusiastically to all of them like out oh. as modi i be gone bl oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it sounded bored i was like you're trying to get people to pay you for this it's not it's not gonna go well but <laughs> that, that was always one of his biggest points is is this view philosophically consistent with what the bible says or what this and like, you can take that's that a, yeah. You can take that sentence is like, it, does it, okay, when you look about the original translation, what about this one from Greece? What about this one from Rome? What about, you're, you're talking about a literalist perspective that can literally be taken and changed, no pun intended literally, but yeah. taken and be changed depending on who you speak to. Uh, yeah. These things, you can't take this single system and try and apply to everybody and again, hope to get the same results or else you get the 60 40 split with uh, the death penalty or the 50 yeah. 50 yeah. 50 split on abortion. Like just people don't agree with each other. Yeah. That's, that's really it at the end of the day, people don't agree with each other and you yeah. run into problems and you try and make them agree with each other. That's kind of the whole, uh, you know? Yeah, no. And, and I, I liked when you said that. And I think, yeah, like with, with, even with Christianity, if someone says they're a Christian, um, well, by the way, you might learn certain things by the way they say it, if they mean Christian and define that separate from Catholicism or something, they're giving some, they're tipping their, uh, hand a bit, but um, but I often want to ask further questions, right? Exactly, like, well, what's your view of the scripture? Are you a literalist or not? Do you believe in inerrancy? What do you what do you believe about you know other world religions or interpretive matters? And and those things often tell you much more about the person's and, and honestly are more interesting points of comparison uh, for a person's religiosity than even what religion you are, because a fundamentalist Jew, Christian, Muslim who says the scriptures are the word, of, the word of God, they cannot be interpreted, but of course they are, but, but they, they would say these things and like they share a worldview much more in common than they would with someone of their own faith that's, let's just say, a more adaptive person when it comes to scriptures or believes religion should evolve or believes the scriptures are more of a human product than a divine product, that those are much more relevant questions and the answers to those questions will tell you much more about a person's actual religiosity than even the issue of what religion are you. So it's kind of funny that we privilege, yeah, these categories, religion, or, or that's like, well, what kind, what kind of religion? Or, yeah, and you believe in Jesus? Okay, what Jesus? Do you believe in Republican Jesus? Or do you believe in, you know, Jesus, the Jesus, a certain view of the Jesus of history? Or do you believe in the Jesus of some of the Orthodox traditions, which have a, you know, slightly different view sometimes of Trinitarian doctrine? I mean, these, yeah, yeah, I think, I think we're on the same page there. <laughs> yeah. I don't believe in any Jesus except the, the white one that everybody associates <laughs> with. <laughs> Like, okay, yeah, that's that's a historical symbol and whatnot. And it, it's <laughs> one of the greatest pieces of product placement, I think. Like, one of the greatest uh, oh, just products the white, white out Jesus? there. Yeah, the white Jesus. Like, it's a perfect, yeah. I think it's a good metaphor for how you've taken everything and painted it with this one brush and tried to sell it back. I mean, I think that's that's a really interesting point, too, is that the fundamentalists of each different religion, even though they believe wildly different things, they go about believing them in the same way in a much different way than the people of their own religion. Do. Yeah. 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 They share much more in common in that entire approach to doing religion. Right. Like I said, mm-hmm. very vertical versus horizontal. It's from God to us. You know, God, like I said, the bumper sticker, I've only seen it in the South, but uh, God says it. I believe that that settles it. I saw it in Alabama a few years ago and I saw it a few times. I was like, that's about as clear of a statement. Now, again, as, as you can imagine for your identity and your religiosity, but the irony there of course is that, that no, no one does that. Right. Uh, in fact, I, even when I first saw it, because it's, you know, in this case, fundamentalist Christians, I want to say, God says it, that settles it. And they'd say, yeah. And you say, okay, so you keep kosher. Oh, no, no, don't do that. Well, God says so. Well, and that was a long time ago. And it's different. You're like, you turn that person, a bumper sticker fundamentalist into a, you know, raging relativist, which mm-hmm. is one question about kosher, about, you know, all, of course, all the other laws and even the, even the, you know, teachings of Jesus, you know, so you believe you should sell your possessions and give them to the poor uh, as a precondition for following, well, no, 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 Jesus wasn't an economist, you know, like, <laughs> not that they would say it that way, but like, but the subtext is, is really telling, right, that in their response, they jump right into these interpretive relativistic frameworks immediately, um, and it's just maybe the hypocrisy of it when they would, is more stark when they start with something like, hey, I'm not interpreting it, I'm just, God says it, that settles it, and you point to potentially hundreds of passages that not only do they not practice, but they don't think you should. And in fact, if some the real irony is if someone did, 
they would call the police, right? If someone was stoning their children for not keeping the Sabbath, I mean, even that person, I, I doubt they would say, well, they, they wronged God. Truly that child next door to me in Mobile, Alabama deserves to be executed by the community, right? They, they would hopefully call the police. And so this idea that it's ever as simple as the uninterpreted word of God directly revealed to us speaks univocally, that that's just uh, nonsense. And ironically, um, you know, it's most obvious uh, uh, amongst the, the contrast between that view and, and not doing it amongst the people who would say that, right? People who would mm -hmm. say, God says it, I would, that settles it. You're like, you probably have the most creative hermeneutical, you know, inner life because <laughs> you have to get around all these passages uh, where God clearly says things in the first person that you don't for a second uh, take seriously. You know? it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those, it's just like emperor's new clothes. You don't talk about it. You say God says it, that settles it. And then you go about living in the way that you do and cherry pick where appropriate. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, and ho hopefully those same people that are stoning their, uh, you know, people for working on Sundays and stuff. Hopefully none of their children end up with any, like, Marilyn Manson or uh, Deicide albums, <laughs> and they'll get stoned for being a witch of some kind. Yeah. But it's, yeah. that, that statement, uh, God says it, like, what was it? Again? I believe that that settles yeah, it. I believe that's, the, what a terrifying way of viewing the world. Terrifying. Yeah. Because at that point, you can ask then, well, what is your perception of God? Does that change? That it, Take out the word God and place a human's name in there. Yeah. And you get all kinds of different scenarios that have happened throughout sure, history. Sure. It's the same sort of mindset. And yeah. that's a little spooky. I think if I ran up and saw that on someone's bumper sticker, I was like, uh. Oh, I saw it a few times. I saw it once and then it was like, I saw it again. I was like, oh, this is like a thing. Like, I don't know if it was a particular, you know, fundamentalist community or something. But um, yeah, it was just uh, outside of Mobile, Alabama. Um, oh, that, that, yeah. that makes sense. Okay. Well, there's also <laughs> quite a few Confederate flags on on uh, people's lawns in that same region. So there's an interesting yep. <laughs> the, 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 the demographics of that situation probably wouldn't surprise anybody. But um, but yeah, no, the, the the concerns I have there maybe and, and you probably do too of a kind of an unbridled authoritarianism or a theocratic sort of possibility for those who talk that way and think that way. And I um, now again. Mm -hmm. Of course, they don't actually live out that um, the, the actual allegiance to those scriptures, but they may live out a certain authoritarianism. I think that's that's my bigger concern. So someone who thinks that way obviously isn't really doing what the scriptures say, but they're much more likely to follow what someone says the scriptures say or what someone says their duty is as a believer. And I think that's that's what, what scares me. Uh, that's what um God, I want to say it's I'm going to miss, I know Hitchens would quote this, but I want to say it was Steven Weinberg that Hitchens was quoting. So this might get messy, but he said, you know, left to their own devices, good people do good things and bad people do bad things. But if you want someone good to do something, do something bad, bad, yeah, get something evil, that takes religion. And I would, I would, I would, you know, I think it goes both ways, by the way. I think you can often, religion may succeed sometimes in making saints out of sinners, but maybe also sinners out of saints. But the point there, I think, is that authoritarianism right, of that someone, whether it's what actually God actually says or not is, is not the point here, but someone who believes in that way of overriding uh, their natural moral sense, right, that you can get somebody to turn against their brother or, of course, their, their brother across the world uh, through military invasion uh, because they believe they're on an errand for God, from God. I think that's, that's a tragic contribution that more vertical notions of, of authority um, have and uh, Hitchens said that right. He said you can you can get them to do it, and often now you can get them to kill their neighbor or whatever, but do it. He says straight away, and with a sense of self righteousness. Yep. And I, and I think that's the fear that I have of this more vertical sort of ethos, um, which you see in that bumper sticker. This idea that if God says it, that's it. So even if I think it's weird and it's inappropriate, it's like I'm not one to question that. Now, of course, like I said, it's usually the people saying that they're speaking on behalf of God who are the ones pulling the strings there, but I think that that more blind allegiance to authority worries me. Um, again, I don't think that's necessarily the case with all religion. That's where I would qualify the Weinberg quote. I don't think mm -hmm. all religion functions that way, but that bumper sticker represents a type of religiosity that can function that way. And so as much as I agree with the new atheists on some stuff, and again, Hitchens is probably my favorite to read. Uh, Harris, I think, is Mine's probably the best philosophy, even though I think, uh, I think I told you, I got into kind of an argument with them about some of the philosophical stuff when he spoke at the Claremont Colleges. Uh, and this was right after 
that end of faith came out. So we had like his bodyguards and it was like a really weird situation and uh, it was really uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. But, but, but Harris, I really, I, th I think he at least attempts to do some, some better philosophy. Um, I think Dennett's probably, I don't know. I probably agree with them the most, but he's also, I think the most tame uh, and Dawkins, I think his forays into philosophy are, are not that great. So I have kind of love likes and dislikes of all of them. Um, but Hitchens, yeah, he, you know, he's a wordsmith. He's everything wonderful and maybe horrible about being British. <laughs> but uh, being a British intellectual, I, I love to hear him speak and, and still watch some of his debates. Uh, but I think he still spoke a little too generally about religion. I think he was still very reductionistic and still let the fundamentalists sort of win uh, the debate over starting points and what counts as religion. I think those are all very regrettable. Uh, and I think all four of them could have done much better philosophy and, and even much, a much better takedown of religion if they had done justice to the diversity of, of viewpoints and different types of religiosity and not, not just jump to the low hanging fruit and then pat themselves on the back after dismantling you know, the Bob Larson's of the world or you know, like, that's, I, I always thought that, like, that's easy to do, man. Now let's talk about, you know, some of the, you know, the, the philosophers of religion that actually do justice to what's possible in these traditions uh, and maybe even what's more actual for many people. Uh, but that said, Hitchens in particular, when it came to just sticking it to the hypocrisy and maybe the, the, the moral, both crimes of religion and the potential for great moral evil of religion, I think Hitchens did the best job of just, you know, just lambasting, I don't know if that's the best term, but just, I mean, just sticking it to lampooning, I think was the term I was looking for there. Uh, but the, <laughs> the, you know, the, the worst tendencies that religion um, has and that have been realized all too often. And so I can appreciate that. Um, but I, again, I still want to, I still believe and both because I know people for whom this is true <laughs> and have worked with, with these people and also seems apparent in my own life, um, that there are possibilities of meaningful religious practice that avoid many of those things. And then to simply say, therefore, they're less religious, I think, uh, I think is just both untrue, but an, an uncharitable interpretation of that. Um, but I think it, it shows a certain lack of, I don't know, I wouldn't say imagination or something on their part, like to, to understand their religious ways of life that are just very different than the ones that they uh, lampoon to use my term. What does lambast mean? As I said, I don't even know. Is that overwhelmed? Like, that's Assault? one of those <laughs> words that sounds like it should work, but I'm not entirely. Yeah. As I, I said, I was like, this is hilarious. Like, oh. lambast, like that does that does sound right, but I don't know. That's, lambast doesn't that just mean like yeah, you just you go all out against something, you yeah, overwhelm it. Like, sounds like I an know. assault. Yeah, something like. I'm that. gonna stick with that. I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna it's pull staying my the PhD. same. Oh, uh, this is great. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, man, we could talk about this for hours, but like, yeah, there's yeah. the, the, the idea that like I'd never quite heard anybody put it quite that way was uh, now that we have the fundamentalists, you know, we've we've broken them down. We've got yes, clear a lot the of brush. Ideas. Let's, let's clear, clear the brush. Now let's actually yeah. talk about religion. What's you know? really going on here? So yeah. I think uh, as we're kind of wrapping this whole thing up, we could talk again for hours. But like, yeah. um, as far as of course, if you let's get these fundamentalists out of the way. Now we're going to take a look at how the general like religious experience is and what does this actually look like for everyday yeah. people. Is that is that the standard that you would then take in like a magnifying glass to and use that to examine? Well, it, it, it gets back to this particularism. So so yeah, let, we can find the most absurdist or anti-science or just conceptually confused or superstitious parts of religion, and those are part of it, and maybe even part of it to a larger degree than I I might want to admit, and this is actually a debate that I've had with a few of my colleagues who kind of have a similar philosophical orientation, where I think I tend to, to try to find the sense and practices, and even when there is some superstition or nonsense, let's take your average fundamentalist or someone who, or, you know, charismatic who follows Bob Larson, I would say, okay, well, there's some confused parts of that. Let's look at the ways of living in, in their everyday life, right, that, that are religious, that might, you know, that might make sense or that there's a possibility of sense of meaning that isn't confused. And I think for most people, like, again, like we've talked about, people are complicated. So this idea of reducing everyone's like Harris has that whole, I think in the first section of end of faith, we talks about belief, you know, is this lever or trigger once pulled that unleashes all these other outcomes. And he talks about believing there's a, a, what, a diamond the size of a refrigerator buried in your backyard or whatever. And, yeah. and so I think, okay, so religious beliefs are part of religion. And in some religions that are more doctrinal or orthodoxic, 
like Christianity, there's a handful of them, and some of them maybe are absurd, right? I, fair enough. Uh, okay, but now let's look at the varieties of religious experience for Christians, even some who may have those beliefs. Um, I think of my great grandmother who passed when I was in graduate school, and uh, but yeah, she came here from Italy and um, was a you know Catholic till the day she died, and at least according to my my extended family, that she would pray for all of her grandchildren and great grandchildren every day for hours and hours and hours and like I don't I don't even know if she knew theology in fact I, I spoke to her a handful of times about related things but I never thought to ask like what's your view of the doctrine of the trinity I kind of think I don't think she would have said much I was like I don't know father son holy spirit something but but in terms of the actual beliefs that she had I don't know that she had many of the ones that Hitchens and Harris and so the others would criticize. I think for her, religion was a way of connecting with their family and heritage and prayers were an act of devotion to others. And she backed it up too. I mean, she's the one who made calls and cards and you know, always gave us a present at the holidays and was very, as much as someone having, I don't know how many, 50 great grandchildren or whatever she had could be involved. And so I think her prayer life and religious med meditative life or contemplative life kind of makes sense in a way. And again, I, I you know, you can accuse me of, special pleading here or having some some connection with my great grandmother but I see many people like that for whom you know they have a certain religious sense and you know monks that meditate like you know maybe I wish I could do that you know but I I see how ways of living make sense and they're connected with certain beliefs but the actual day-to-day -day living isn't really much about beliefs it's about maybe living for something greater than yourselves or seeing your life as a sacrifice to others or maybe empowering yourself I think of some types of meditation, vipassana, and others that, that might be, some of you have been critical of them being too selfish, or some types of Satanism too, right? There's some that are more hedonistic, and okay, well, that's a whole thing, and then there's also more humanistic types of Satanism, and so I just want to say, like, it's just a big, you know, it's a big freaking world out there, and even for the life of one, one person to criticize their whole way of being religious by looking at the absurdity of certain beliefs, uh, or maybe moral atrocities committed by people in the name of those beliefs, like, that's important. Um, but again, if you're an anthropologist or sociologist or psychologist or philosopher with your degree, I, I hope you can look at the deeper. Um, I think Wittgenstein said something like that, right? It's like, don't, don't think, look. Mm -hmm. and, and looking means getting dirty. Getting into the life of a religious community, doing thick description, ethnography. Like for me, description should replace the more normative pronouncements of both religious apologists and their critics. And so describe, 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 look at connections between their, their other forms of life or other parts of their life. And you'll see all sorts of meaningful things and absurd things. And it's just, it's such a mixed bag that it frustrates me when anyone, including classical theorists of religion, I don't think you've had my intro religion class, but we do, you know, Freud and Feuerbach and Karl Marx and mm -hmm. Weber, uh, Tyler and Fraser, and you know, many of those are reductionists. You know, all religion is a failed hypothesis, right? Like, magic or like Tyler and Fraser for Freud. It's all an illusion or delusion. It's like, well, okay, that might be part of it for some people, some of the time, but then there's so many other parts that are communal and social and personal and all that stuff. So I just want to say those are all part of it and don't miss the forest for the trees. And I think the low hanging fruit is, is often these absurdities or moral atrocities. And there's a few things, but there's often more to it than that. But I'll just say, so I'm telling the story with my great grandmother. I remember I was telling one of my friends who is a new atheist type. Um, in fact, he's even on some of the new atheist literature and stuff. And he was like, well, he was like, well, tell me, a, a, you know, an example of a lightweight way, way of being religious that makes sense. And I was like, well, I don't know. Maybe this kind of makes sense. I kind of can see it. And he's just like, why didn't you ever just tell her to quit wasting her time? <laughs> and I'm like, like, even if I believe that for some reason, you know, I don't like, but his point was prayer should be understood, right? As some attempted a causally efficacious way of changing the world. It doesn't, so tell her to stop it. And I'm like, you just lack any I, sociological I just, imagination. I There's so much more. Yeah. I just don't want to be a dick to my grandma. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, but I even push it further. So, so, cause what he thought I was agreeing with was that it is silly and superstitious, but I just don't have a heart. And I was saying, well, there may be superstitious parts of it, but honestly, I don't, if you ask her, to give an account of what her prayer, I mean, like a philosophical account of what her prayer is all about. I don't think she would talk about causality or causal efficacy. I think she would just say, I love my grandchildren. Why wouldn't I want to pray, pray on them for hours a day? And like, yeah, maybe you or I or others might not be able to do that, but we might be all the worse for it. And I think of it in my thought life and my meditative life, like focusing on the interests of others and caring about that can be one of the most transformative things in your life. And maybe the theological 
structure behind it is silly or superstitious at times, but to say that, that that's the end of it, therefore it's worthless, therefore your grandmother's wasted her life. Um, no, I don't think it's just that I take it personally because I, I, I've thought about this a bit uh, and I can do with many other people for whom I disagree with even a lot of their religious claims um, more, more fervently than, than, than I would maybe with, with my grandmother. But I think to focus on that part of it, again, might miss what's most meaningful about those practices, right? So you'd be like, what's the, what's the philosophical theological structure that undergirds her prayer? I'm like, she doesn't care about that. Maybe you do. Uh, yeah. But if you're doing good anthropology, look at that connection of that with other things in her life, right? Of, of her love for others and her selflessness in general and her thoughtfulness around birthdays and holidays. And like, that was a way of her connecting. If you think of it, forget about prayer, but spending a couple hours a day in your thought life uh, that then results in action to, to think about how to cheer someone up, to think about how to make someone's life better. And that, you know, to, to say, well, it's all meaningless because it doesn't actually causally change the structure of the universe. Like, okay, well, good for you and that kind of petty takedown. Uh, and again, I don't think the New Atheists do only that, but they do a lot of that. And, and uh, I, almost at every time where they, again, lampoon or lambast, whatever we're saying, <laughs> one of these yeah. beliefs or practices, I want to say, well, okay, that's part of it. Okay, let's, the conceptual confusion part. Okay, that's fine. But now what about the rest of it? You know, and uh, now there are times where the superstition goes all the way down and maybe even the immorality goes all the way down, right? Uh, and so it's not that it excuses it or justifies all these practices entirely. It's just saying that even some confused practices have some meaning, uh, you know, even, you know, so it's, I just think it's a big, it's a bigger world out there when it comes to understanding com complex macro social psychological phenomena like religion and to reduce it all to, uh, Sam Harris even says it, you can Google, there's like a big think video where he says religion is, and just almost verbatim, religion is a failed hypothesis. It's a failed science. Religion is early humans attempt to understand yeah. the world and they just got it wrong. I'm like, okay, this is, this is called intellectualism, right? Of Tyler and Fraser from a hundred and something years ago. And they were just wrong. Like, I mean, that, that, that most anthropologists now are like, well, okay, that was one attempt to get at what part of religion deals with. But to say that's what it is, you know, is a really narrow de definition of is by focusing on the intellectual or cognitive content of particular claims. It's like, that's what a narrow view of what religion is, you know? And again, part of it, sure. I, I don't mind the exposing the Bob Larson's or the Peter Popoff's and saying this type of superstition is not only just intellectually nonsense, but it's morally catastrophic. Perfect. But it might be possible that someone, even with some of the superstitious beliefs, like the person who shows up there, to have their son with Down syndrome be healed, that there's a deep confusion behind it. But there may be a hope there and a love for their child that now when filtered through this confusion of religion results in a practice that, you know, you know yeah, is tragic. Um, but even there, I wanna say, you know, maybe the Peter Popoff is the charlatan all the way down through and through. But the person showing up who actually shares some of those beliefs, um, you know, might have a very different experience and one that might evoke sympathy rather than ridicule. If they took the time to actually look rather than simply think and assume that what really matters here in understanding the situation is, are they right or wrong about God and the causal efficacy of prayer? Like, then you haven't even started, man. You know, how complicated someone's reasons and inner life and social world is where they get to a point they're taking their child with down syndrome to a healing service by some apostle in the middle of nowhere like that's that's a story there and i want to hear that story I, yeah. i'm not satisfied with hey they're wrong so next <laughs> like what well, you know the, what a shallow view of the human experience yeah exactly and that, that's the part that i think you've gotten you hit on the most is approaching yeah. religion and approaching religious experience and how people actually express this on a human level on an emotional level like you mentioned your grandmother praying for her children the cause out the prayer itself isn't really the focus this is how she expresses her love for her grandchildren there we go yeah she's not using it as a weapon to whether you can scientifically verify that or not isn't really <laughs> yes. going to have any bearing over not well, yeah, and my, yeah my point is that the fact that she isn't interested in that verification is is philosophically significant, right? So, so this is my problem. So, you know, there's, there's sort of a difference between what you do in terms of your practices and religion and then the philosophical account you or others might give of what you're doing, right? Those are different things. And I think all too often there's an assumption 
or, or, or in the philosophical account you give of someone's practice, you end up reducing it and narrowing it down to things that really aren't even operable in the thought life or even subconscious of the person doing it. You sort of, you know, impute these motives and intentions and false beliefs and whatever and superstition. Like, they, they, those just might not even be there, man. You got to look. Now, maybe in their neighbor next door, it is. Maybe someone is praying for healing and then they call the doctor, like, check the x-ray again. I just prayed the compound fracture back in. So don't worry about doing the surgery on the leg. You know, like, that would be superstitious and kind of crazy. The fact that that almost never happens is philosophically interesting, right? So think about prayer for healing. Like I said, I mean, there's a certain kind of person who may take it very literally, right? But it's very rare that, you know, those types of things are prayed for because there's a certain understanding that that's not, not exactly the way it works causally. And now there are people, so there's Christian scientists and some who have, you know, and maybe even some Scientologists who have a certain view about the power of the mind or whatever. But I'm just saying in general, people who pray for healing don't generally have a causal view of that. At least it's not the same as a doctor. It's not like, hey, should we go to see Dr. Jones to put the bone back in or you want to pray it back in? Let's yeah. just flip a coin or is God a cause? Like, you know, so I think often there's a view that they're doing something in a way that is superstitious, right? This view, the criti critical view of Hitchens and Harris, whatever. Um, but that if you look closely, you'll see they, in fact, harbor no such view. They're not, the rest of their life shows us that. They're not saying check the x-ray after they pray. Now, again, some do. And I, as I'm saying, I know people who do. <laughs> but, but I think so, so many times when people pray for other people or whatever, like you said, it's about, you know, giving your thought life to them. It's about hoping. It's about coming to maybe even accept what will or will not happen. Um, so pushing against what will happen or, or, you know, and those sorts of things. So you may, it may take, you may say the words, God, I hope this person's healed. But the words aren't magic, right? That you have to look as an anthropologist and see what those words actually amount to by seeing the role it plays in their lives. And I think when we reduce it to propositional claims, right, that a prayer for healing is inherently invoking a causal theory about God being a cosmic physician, that may happen. And I know people for whom that does happen, but it often doesn't happen that way. And to reduce it to that, you actually distort what's in front of us. You actually give a confused account of a practice that actually has a certain sense that we can all be sympathetic to. And often the effort to lampoon it, <laughs> you distort it and give an account that's not even actual. I mean, it's factually wrong about what that person believes, what role those beliefs play in their lives. And I've seen this in many accounts by, you know, again, the new atheists where they just so miss what's going on because they're obsessed with what's wrong with what they think is going on and they give an account that's not even actual. That's not what this person believes, you know? But again, there are people who do that. So you find those and lampoon those. And I, I kind of applaud that, but I'm just like, all right, now let's talk about the types of this practice that don't have all those confusions and that people don't think of it that way. And that people know when they pray, they're just accepting what happens, but they, you know, it expresses their love and their hope and their concern and aligning their wills with other people. And, there's the communal aspects and the psychological aspects and that those aren't always confused. They may be. And of course it's fun to find when they are confused. <laughs> I mean, I enjoy that too, but, but I think that there's more to it. And I think to pat yourself on the back, once you, like I said, clear the low hanging fruit or the brush and say, well, their prayer's done. Check. God's done. Check. You know, <laughs> religious morality check. You're like, well, you, you've shown what the worst amongst us, have done with that and exposed maybe the superstitions or confusions behind that. But that's, you know, now, let, now let's talk for real. Get off the podium. Let's all just, just stop talking. We'll summarize this whole thing. We'll fix this whole thing. Let's, let's get on the mats and let's choke each other until we feel better. <laughs> I think that's, Agreed. Oh, this, man, the great, yeah. that, that's, that's, that's the solution to all of it. Well, Again, thank you so much. We f we beat it. We got the curse out of the way. We finally. Oh did. wait, wait till the technology. I mean, see, if you play it back and it's all garbled, you know that the curse was on. <laughs> Honestly, I wouldn't even be surprised, but I'm not really all that worried about it because I have a feeling we'll be doing this again sometime. There's so much that we could go on about and talk about. I really appreciate yeah, anytime. you finally getting on here. We can talk about jujitsu, whatever else. There's all kinds of different things we can get into, but of course. thank you so much. Dr. Ryan Falcioni, it was a pleasure. <laughs> right. uh, it was a pleasure uh, taking your class, and I really, really miss those mats, and I'm excited to get back to it once all the gyms are open and uh, there's not a whole risk for our families in order to go there. Agreed, man. I can't. Yeah, I, I, of all the things we've talked about, uh, 
and the significance of those probably outweighing any anything I'm about to say here. The thing I miss the most right now is jujitsu. <laughs> it's not it's not the daily philosophizing. It's it's getting choked out and choking others out. But there's something very uh, immediate about that experience that uh, yeah may, maybe there's a connection with a certain religious sense that we could talk about. But yeah, I, I miss that a lot. I miss yeah we we rolled a few times. I miss I miss it, man. Hopefully soon. Yeah, a little bit. Well, you know philosophizing as a way you can get lost in your own head you, you figure things out and you, your head gets cleared up when it you know it hits the mat after a good throw or whatever but <laughs> when you're slowly blacking out you, <laughs> things immediately become, what matters becomes clear yes exactly uh, exactly well thank you so much and i look forward to uh, talking to you more and having you on here again in the future it's nothing but a pleasure uh, me too thanks so much austin look forward to um yeah talking to you soon